So, to introduce her again, I did it yesterday. She's in, first and foremost from Breitholt and Valur, and then very successful football coach. So we spent half of the lunch trying to fix this presentation because there, are, there were supposed to be some videos here that are not going to be shown because it's going to be too complicated. So I picked out the three most important. And so I will have to go out of the presentation to show you the videos when they come. But it will be fine anyways. Uh, I have to say that it's perfect that I come after Svali because if I was not uh, raised up in that club, I would definitely not be standing here because uh, that's where I learned basically everything I know. I, I used to say that I know a lot but a, a, about a, a few things and that's basically within what I learned in Valor. And uh, when people ask me like what was most important being raised up in Valor, uh, then I say uh, Ella Beta, Baldur and Sverir. And who are these people? They are people that basically nobody knows except three people in the room because they were the people cleaning the toilets, uh, making sure that we were not staying in the house for too long time. I was there till the last bus went to Breitholt every single day from uh, starting to play football in that club. And if I, if I wouldn't have uh, spend my time with these people, I would not be understanding what life is about and how a club should be working, actually. So I think it's perfect to come after him because I will definitely be uh, connecting a lot of stuff to Valur. And I was actually going to show you a video here, so now I have to go out. And uh, if you don't know who this is, you have a problem. Uh, but... Uh, we need to have sound on. Uh, and it's not on. Yeah, but, and if it isn't, then we just fix it in a different way. So. Okay. Uh, not gonna happen. Anybody has a, an idea? Or? We, we really thought this would work. Okay, uh, it, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna jump over it. Yeah, okay. I can tell you what it says. It's just not as powerful. Just tips to the people here that are running this. Uh, remember to tell people that they can't do their presentations in keynote. Sorry. Okay, so uh, this video was two minutes. 
with Tom Brady. And I got some questions yesterday from uh, when sitting in the workshop groups. One group asked me what inspires me and um, what inspires me are stories, basically, and uh, listening to other people talk about what they have experienced. And uh, Tom Brady is definitely one of my biggest inspirations. I don't watch videos with him often or read books with him often. It's enough to watch a game with him. If you haven't seen a game with Tom Brady, you should definitely uh, use the last option to do that because he's probably playing his last year. And he is uh, probably the oldest athlete on a high uh, level being as good as he is. So he is uh, a great role model for all of us, especially coming from a, a underdog situation where he wasn't picked in the university uh, tryouts and all that. He was not good. And uh, he is saying in this video, which I think is so important and which I thought was so important to show you, is that <laughs> uh, he's talking in that video about when I play, when you play as a team, you represent so many people. And he's talking about a little bit of details around that. And I think everybody, Svali was just showing this, all these 3,000 people in uh, Lider and they're watching a final in the basket. And this is what we're all looking for and what we crave is as a coaches and players that we want people to be following us and uh, feeling with us, losing with us, winning with us, and all that. And uh, you represent a lot of people out there. And I even thought like that when I was uh, coaching Valor 2004, my first year with a team, that uh, we had 80 people coming to the game. I remember counting them myself in the middle of the game and being disappointed. And uh, for me, 80 people were also a lot of people. There were not 3,000, but it's a lot of people. It's more than uh, the amount of people that are sitting in here. And uh, uh, he, Tom Brady, like I said, is a great role model. That's why I put that word in there. But you also have a choice of reading the meaning of things or a question that you get in two different ways, mainly. Maybe more, but mainly two different ways. So yesterday, I don't know if that uh, woman is in here from Grindavik. Okay, so we spoke about this. We talk about uh, a club that has men and women. So I often hear, and I spoke like this myself when I was coaching the women's team in Valur uh, uh, my first year. So I was coaching a women's team in a men's club dominated by men. And I looked at it as a negative thing. And uh, I've learned through the years that I didn't have to see it that way. I can also see it in a way that uh, I'm, I'm coaching a women's team in a club that is uh, dominated by men, but hopefully the women are finding the way in, like we were doing. And so often you just receive a question and you automatically start to think the negative uh, part of the question. And through my presentation, I will come back to this. Uh, I think it's extremely important to create a community around the brand, and the brand can be the club, it can be my team, it can be my athlete, it can be me. You want to create a brand around all of these uh, persons, especially the club, and that's where the culture comes in, and I spoke about that a little bit yesterday, and other people have spoken about that today. So. I want to jump into this directly. You want to create an engaged community. You want to find people easily to get into the board that isn't that easy in many uh, clubs and cultures. I still think we can affect that. And I think we can affect that uh, at early age. And if we don't do that at early age, I think it's more difficult to find Svali and me and Gusti and these people we've been speaking about here, I think it's difficult if we don't start when we are younger. And these people are dying out a little bit. Uh, the, the club people, if we can call it that way. So I believe that engagement happens when a person's motivation meets the right environment and opportunities. So I 
get the question sometimes, oh, uh, you're really good at motivating. And uh, I just say, no, I, I don't think I'm good at that. I think uh, I can give energy and people can like buy into what I'm saying and then they want to follow. But m I don't motivate. I think I can offer an opportunity or uh, build an environment that activates the motivation that is within the person. That's also what Tom Brady was talking about in this two minutes video is that it doesn't need a lot of external motivation because he has enough of it with inside himself. And not everybody feels that way. But I, I still believe, right or wrong, I don't care, I believe that uh, we have this motivation in, inside of us and it can be activated by the right opportunity and the right people around you. And then we come back to this flow model that we went through yesterday that some psychologists in Sweden don't like, but obviously the psychologists in Iceland like flow model. I'm happy to hear that. And uh, I will always come back to this. I'm obsessed with the flow model. And uh, then it's just how you use it and how you talk about it and all that. If I'm bored, then I'm not going to succeed with anything. And uh, I will probably jump into this while going through the most important things in my presentation now because I was asked to talk about social uh, participation and sponsorship. But I will speak about it from the view of a player and a coach uh, and how this can be connected in a cycle. So I'm not like, I'm not interested in being right now, being a head coach, I'm not interested in being a, a board member or a marketing person selling the sponsorship or whatever, but I'm going to speak about it from the view of a coach and a player. So we have to find our fans. They don't come to us just on an order. You don't go into an app and then you order a pizza from Domino's and then you pick it up in 30 minutes and then you add whatever you want on it. That would be really easy. But the fans, these 3000 fans that came in there to watch the basketball game, they did not come because they were playing a final. Uh, 2022, I think they came there because of a vision and a plan that was obviously made on a paper. When was it? 2008? And it took time. It's a, it's a slow motion action, but it had a very clear end goal. And they managed to do one of the go like finish one of the goals in 2022. And that's where they found their fans on the way. Because I know that on the way, they picked up a lot of kids. You heard that, 368 or whatever. And these kids have parents, and they have grandparents, and they have friends, and they have whatever. And all these people got something, and then they wanted to give something in return. So engage with your fans in a meaningful way is something that I repeatedly, constantly say to my players. It's extremely important for the players to understand that they are the movie. We spoke about this also in one of the rooms yesterday. I just look at a football game that my team is playing as a movie. I like to see our game as an avatar because everybody wants to see avatar. And then we get this boring romantic movie that half of the group doesn't want to see. Nobody goes to see a movie that people are saying is boring but everybody wants to see the movie that is great. So I like to say to my players that you have to engage your fans in a meaningful way, no matter if they are five or if they are 3,000. It doesn't matter. Uh, we need to give before we take. I think players have problems understanding this, that you just come and you want this and this and this and you want a lot but you're not ready to give that much. I don't want these characters on my team. If I feel like a player does not want to give, then they can go somewhere else where they can take. Because in our environment, you have to give a lot. You have to understand the sponsor thing. Is that a thing or is it something that is maybe our lifeline? Like we saw a, a diagram before with a lot of companies. But I'm pretty sure that many of the players that are playing in Valor, because I know it was like that when I was playing there, 
I know that the players that I coached when I was coaching Valur, uh, they did not understand this. And I actually did not understand this till a lot later after a conversation with a great man that I'm going to tell you about a little bit later. It's uh, understanding why a company wants to invest in you. Like, why does a company that is actually trying to work on uh, a profit, why do they want to invest in you, your team, maybe your player? Sometimes we call somebody who like, really want to sign this forward. She's great. She can score 30 goals for us. And I don't have money. Berkut says no. So please help me. And uh, yeah. What happens is that the company has to go through the idea of investing in this idea or project or player or whatever you say. And uh, I think it took me way too many years to understand how a sponsor thinks. So I will jump into that a little bit later. Social projects is something that I also realized that is uh, very important for us as a club today and it gives you so much in return. And then you have role models, or do we? I think they should be role models, but way too many players do not understand the meaning of this. And that's where I'm going to go back to raising them up early to, to uh, get them to the point where they become our coaches or referees or spectators or board members or sport directors, or even just working on our home games. So we spoke about this also in one of the mini groups yesterday. So if I get a 16-year-old coming to the first training in the A-team, the first conversation I have with that player is, welcome to the A-team. Uh, now you have become a role model for other kids in this club. And you need to understand what that is and what that means. So you walk around in the hallways, or you meet a kid that is nine years old, you meet a girl with her football cleats on, then you ask her what her name is, and you ask her what team she's playing in, and you are Amelia, and you are playing in the eight team. When are you playing? How did your game go? And you actually put effort into knowing what's going on, and, and try to find that interest within yourself to know what's going on in your own club. Like these girls are gonna come and play with you at some point, uh, maybe in the club, maybe also in a national team. And maybe this girl is gonna be uh, coaching you in 10 years. I ended up coaching players that were older than me. They never thought that I would be their coach. Two of them quit directly when I took over because we did not get along. They were not good role models. I didn't like them, they didn't like me. Maybe they could have been different if the culture would have been different before, I have no idea. But I think it's extremely important to teach them this and that they learn to support and help the next generation because they are the best ones to do that. So, in a modern world, then I think you need to promote your brand and encourage people to share content with the friends and fans. I think it's impossible to build a club today without focusing on this. So, that, and then we need to talk about social media. I mean, they are all anyways on social media. We are. So how can we use it? Uh, I, people love to share pictures with themselves. They love to open the phone and look at a picture or an interview that was taken yesterday with me. And then you find it and then you go share it. And that's actually where the club and the team and the brand gets more followers. You, if you don't, you're not visible, you, you're not there, then you don't exist. So this is something we have worked on a, a lot, but also like be careful what you are posting. And we run this pretty, uh, I'd say in a very structured way in my club today. Uh, how we do this, so what we share, and, and think about all the details, like how can we get the most uh, uh, spreaded film or whatever, and that we create some kind of a win-win concept. Because it, it's all related to sponsors, to the parents, to the kids in our club, uh, and uh, 
going into my town, which is Kijuansta, uh, how we pronounce it. And uh, it's a small little town that you heard a lot about two weeks ago when Iceland was playing there. And uh, very small, but very friendly, extremely sport interested people. So it means that there is a history of sports, but football in this town has been like basketball in Valur, that you, you shouldn't play football in this town. It's a humble town and uh, a hockey town, not football. So it has taken a lot of effort and energy to build something up there. It has taken 14 years uh, of my life to be a part of building something big, believing in it, getting a lot of setbacks. And uh, we decided when we made a new strategy 2016, which I'm gonna dig into a little bit deeper soon, that uh, we need to do more things with the town in our hearts. And one of the strategies was that we spoke with everybody that possibly would go on interviews, that on every single interview, you say, we call our club KDFF most of the times, but we have changed that from 2016 to speaking about Krihvansta. So you automatically often put the name of the town into news. And uh, that gives a lot of value to the town. And no matter if you are speaking in, in a national TV or international TV, or even on a website or in a podcast, you will hear all of us mention Krihvansta many times. And we thought a lot about this, like how can we get them to love us through what we love doing? Because we spend so many hours uh, doing this, football and other people, other sports, and it's just, it's, it's very difficult to get people to love this, what we are doing, or love us, loving what you, we do. And um, then I just always come back to the same thing that I spoke about yesterday, that there is a strategy for everything. You just have to make a strategy and you have to put a lot of effort and work into a strategy. You have to connect people to the strategy and then you have to execute the strategy. And uh, I have to change it during, like through the, the journey because things change, there are setbacks which give you great comebacks. And uh, this is my by far biggest inspiration, by far. And I even, uh, I'm just gonna take it fast, but uh, this is my biggest inspiration in, within football, but also I decided 2007 when I was pregnant and I thought I'm not gonna be able to coach as much, so I, I might just, uh, uh, open a company or something, and I was eating a cheeseburger at the American style, and I hear these two guys uh, on the next table talk about laser doom, like laser tag. And they were speaking about laser tag and how it burned down in Skavan. Do you remember this? Yeah, there was this uh, fire, and there was no laser tag anymore in Iceland. And I seriously walked up, I, I just stood up and it took me two minutes. I walked out to the car and I called my husband and I said, we're opening a laser tag. <laughs> and he was like, we're not opening a laser tag. Yes, we are. We're definitely opening a laser tag. Like everybody loves laser tag and there's no laser tag in Iceland. And I would get some money to buy, you know, players and stuff. And uh, that's always my like ground idea somewhere uh, in the beginning. And I'm pregnant and I can't coach and I can work there. And uh, the kid can sleep there while I'm working. It's just really simple. So we opened uh, Laser Tag up in Salakarvi, if you have seen that. Yeah, that was us. It was Europe's biggest laser tag. And I can't even tell you how much, there's nobody from the, the tax company here. I don't know how many black money we took there at that time. <laughs> and uh, nobody cared, so, and it went into nice things. So, why did I do this? Well, because of this guy. Because I had just uh, listened to an interview or uh, that was this woman from New York Times talking about Walt Disney and seriously, I would never have opened this if I wouldn't have heard this. So Walt Disney, she's interviewing Walt Disney 
uh, when he's dying, he died four years before Disney World opened. He was just mm -hmm. about to build Disney World. And this woman asks uh, uh, Walt Disney, how do you feel about not being able to see Disney World? You're not gonna survive uh, your dream. And he goes laughing and is like, what is wrong with you? Like, do you seriously think that your kids are gonna uh, go running around in Disney World if I haven't experienced Disney World? This is my dream and my vision, and I've done all of this uh, multiple times in my head. I don't need to go there and experience the, the Mickey Mouse and the carousels and all this stuff. You're gonna do it. So, and he's like, you can Google all about Walt Disney and you're gonna see this. Like, you have to have a plan, you have to have a vision, you have to have dreams. And then we can just, uh, he was gonna create the happiest place on earth, probably did. All like cancer sick kids, they go to Disney World, the, the last thing they do. This was his dream. He saw all of this happen before anybody else did. And this is what he constantly was speaking about that if you can visualize it, visualize it, you can dream it, and then you can definitely do it. And I was uh, obsessed with this. So I saw Laser Tag uh, sitting at American Style, like uh, going in there because I loved playing it. And then I just saw in front of me how I was gonna earn a lot of money to do all this extra fun stuff that uh, I wanted to do with my team. So it's just connected in a crazy way. But at the same time, I love this that we keep moving forward, opening new doors, doing new things because we are curious and it leads us to new paths. And uh, this is the flow model as well. So if we, you don't feel like this, you don't have a laser tech to open, you don't have a new team to build, you don't have a new whatever. If I don't have a challenge that I love, then I'm bored. So uh, the, the whole thing, started with a mouse. This is not a joke. He created a mouse. He was not gonna make a Disney World. That was never the plan. He just created a mouse. And when Sierra Friedrich, 112 years ago soon, uh, founded Valur, he was a mouse. It was a mouse. I think I was a mouse. I was a bad football player. I did not play as uh, somebody wrote, uh, I was, uh, I think it was uh, on roof yesterday. After a successful career as a player, Elizabeth started uh, to become a coach. And I was like, that's a lie. I was not a successful football player, I was a mouse. So just going around, not daring to speak and uh, never started games, like was most of the times on the bench, like, yeah. But uh, this little mouse found a way to become something bigger, just like uh, Disney. And uh, this little mouse is worth $160 billion today. And okay, we uh, are working with sports. I'm not talking about like, we don't have a net worth of anything like this, but we have trophies, we have national team players, we have X amount of youth players. And that's our, that's our net worth. And 2016, something just happened that changed a, uh, a lot of things for me and everybody I work with. Uh, and the I ironic thing is that it happened on the 11th of May, back to Valur, because it's uh, Valur's birthday. So I had been coaching Kriwansta uh, for seven years. We had, we lost, we, I broke a record in Sweden in 2009. I came, why did I go there anyways? People were saying we had won four league titles with Valur, and people were saying, and I remember this, and I don't even know why this uh, bothered me, but I remember Thora, who played in Breidablik and the national team, saying uh, a bag of sand could coach this team, and they would still win. And uh, I was young at that time, and this just, hit me hard and I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm gonna take a small team and uh, build something big out of it. Then it's gonna be so small that a, a bag of sand couldn't do anything with that team. It's seriously the reason why I ended up there. Uh, as small as it can be. And we ended up losing the first 10 games. It was a great experience.
but horrible for health. But going through that and knowing and getting the journalists coming, you broke a record today of 10 consecutive losses. How do you feel? Well, you always win after you lose, so it's coming. And uh, it went like that for many rounds. We ended up saving ourselves uh, in the last round on one goal, uh, ending up 10th, two, uh, two teams got relegated. And then we just slowly climbed to ninth and seventh and fifth, dropped down to seven, fifth, and here we're all feeling like, okay, two more years and we're at the top. Uh, the board comes to me and tells me that uh, we have to take down the budget 50%. We're not going to be able to pay out the salary. And we go into 2016 and we die. On the 11th of May, uh, I have to tell my players and the staff that we have gone bankrupt and we have played our last game. And I don't even, I don't even understand why I took up the phone and photographed this, but I'm happy that I did because uh, it's a great moment to have on a picture, or in a picture. We were last in the league at that moment, about to get relegated, and we needed 1.280 thousand Swedish kroners uh, till the 31st of August to save ourselves. That's a lot of money. That's uh, for a female football club to get, I don't know what it is, around 20 million Icelandic kroners. And uh, I, for the first time felt like out of air and I told them I seriously think this is, we're over. And uh, this uh, girl comes to me who had played for me since 2009 and she says to me, she walks up from that bench towards me and I will never, I get goosebumps still when I talk about this. She comes to me and she just looks me in the eyes and she says, you have taught us since 2009 that we never, we never give up. There is, there is no impossible. No, no, no. We have to be able to save this in any possible way. So please, can we have a meeting? We can be three, four people and we need to be able to do something. So we sat down, uh, three people. We go into a meeting with a board that had already died and we asked if we could figure out something over the night and start doing tomorrow. They say yes, but you know that we have to pay the taxes in four days. If we don't, we're, to we're completely dead. So here is uh, the horrible thing with me not being able to show you a video because um, we knew that there would be challenges on the way. Setbacks are great. I love setbacks today after experiencing this because setbacks is seriously what makes you great because it gives you the moment of comebacks and the comebacks can be amazing. I've experienced that uh, now many times and we needed to give more before we could take and I realized that completely in this moment and uh, we needed a great comeback and it had to come extremely fast. And this is where uh, the players just said to me, we are amazing. Uh, Sif was like, you've said to me since I was in Valor that nobody's better than us. Maybe I'm just childish and I believe that. And then I am childish because I still believe that. We are better than everybody. Maybe not always in football games, but in everything else. And uh, they came up with an idea to figure out how to let everybody know about those. So they did a video that I can't show you. <laughs> and this video, you, half of the, uh, the group here would go crying uh, watching this video because the music is that way and what they say in the video because they have their voice in the background uh, talking to people in town. And it was a, it's a great video. It's on YouTube, so you just Google uh, KDFF 2016, and you'll find it, and then you can watch it. So, this story would be so boring and bad if it wouldn't have ended up like it did. So, on the 6th of November, we had uh, raised 1,750,000, so more money than we basically needed. 
And uh, we saved ourselves in the last game from getting relegated with one point. And uh, that goal that we score is, of course, in the 92nd minute. And the field is looking like this. And you can imagine the celebration. You can see that everybody has slide tackled into that celebration. So uh, a, a moment of a setback that I've never seen before and never experienced before. And I know that I will experience again. Uh, then, from that day, I wanted to know more. I wanted to become so much better at understanding everything behind this scene that we are always standing on. So I, was, I read a lot, uh, psychology, economy, like I never read books about uh, the woman that got killed in the park. Like, it gives me nothing. I, I, I respect people that read stuff like that but I don't learn anything by reading that, but reading stuff uh, with people that have experienced something is just life. And this guy is the richest man in Sweden, uh, according to the Forbes list. And I didn't want to meet him because of money, definitely not. But he was saying in media that he was the biggest private sponsor within sports in Sweden. Uh, puts in like, uh, now I have to figure out how much that is in Icelandic. It's around 300 million in a club a year. And that's a lot of money from uh, one guy. But he quit doing it, and uh, he went into a lot of interviews, and he said, the sports people, they don't understand shit. They don't understand where money comes from. They don't understand who it is that is making it possible for them to do what they love. So I decided that I had to have a meeting with him, because I didn't understand it. And uh, I wanted to understand. So I call his personal assistant, who uh, screamed at me a couple of times, because I, try, I think I called her seven times uh, before uh, being successful. And uh, she's, he's, she said to me, you know, that a lot of people want to meet Rune, and uh, you're not meeting up with him. OK. Uh, I'm, I'm meeting up with him, definitely. So I go Google him again and a lot, and then I see that uh, his company is filming in Iceland with a smart eyes uh, company, it's, uh, uh, glasses and sunglasses. And so I call her again, and I speak English, and I say to her that I'm an Icelandic journalist, and I uh, <laughs> really want to interview this Rune because of a, a, a advertised they're filming in Iceland, and oh, here's his mobile number. <gasps> I go, okay, strategy. You just have to like think a little bit extra before you get there. And there was the easiest uh, meeting to get, but was it easy to drive to Malmö and walk into that meeting being the Icelandic journalist? No. I walk into that meeting and I try to explain for him the first two minutes that I'm not a journalist, I'm a football coach from uh, Kristianstad actually Iceland, but um, you know, women's football? You know Marta, right? No? I don't know Marta. And I don't know anything about you and this club and wh what are you doing here? Like I have a lot to do with my time and I said, well, I light myself in here because uh, blah, blah, blah. And a guy that has, uh, that has, uh, that is an entrepreneur uh, loves, of course, a story like this. He loves people that just finds a way in. So we got good friends. We had a meeting of three hours. I asked, and he said, the first thing he said to me, you want my money? No. I seriously don't want your money. It would be great, but it's not what I'm after. I'm after uh, answers to a few questions. So I started just putting in my questions. And these questions were a lot about understanding what goes in the mind of a sponsor. And he asks me, the first question he asks me is, where do you drink your coffee? Like, what? Where do you drink your coffee in your town? I said, well, different places. OK, Wayne's Coffee, maybe? And the uh, Espresso House? Yeah, I do that. Yeah, because of the fancy uh, interior stuff. And you can take a picture. and all this stuff, and uh, you don't understand that this coffee is coming from Norway, and it's uh, a central company that will never sponsor a sports club. And you also pay 20 kroners more than if you, paid, if you buy it from a local coffee shop, probably sponsors your club. 
How many coffee shops are, and bakeries are sponsoring your club? Well, I don't know. You don't know? No, I don't know. And maybe you should go back and ask your people on the board or the marketing department, where uh, do we have any coffee shops that, or coffee places that sponsor us? Because then maybe I should go drink my coffee there. And I had, I'd never thought about this, seriously. So I'm wondering if all the people in Valor Basket is buying their uh, gas at Costco. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure that there are people that don't because they have no idea. They seriously have no idea. I had no idea. I did not understand the meaning of this. And he said to me as well, oh, how many social projects do you have? Zero. Do you have a, a sponsor network? Yeah. I don't know. Do you have uh, youth teams? And I said, yeah, we don't have that many youth teams. So he just gave me a script of four things. Social projects, uh, company network, youth development. I knew that pretty well. It was just more of a strategy how to do it in Sweden and understanding of uh, products, like uh, where do you buy your stuff? And I took this with me and I was driving the car on the way back from Alma and I was like, how can you learn so much from three hours? So I decided in the car, which I told some of you yesterday, that I would have 100 meetings like this. Exactly the similar meetings with like people like this. And I was not gonna have a time frame on that. Just gonna do 100 meetings. And I did with, uh, I don't many, I don't like, I met up with uh, a guy in Helsingborg that plays uh, Thilla. Because I hate Thilla. What? What is that in English? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's just because it's an instrument that I hate. I don't know why. I don't hate it anymore after that meeting. Because I just wanted to meet up with a person that plays this instrument 12 hours a day and has the same passion for that as me playing football or coaching a team. I want to understand, like, what the hell is going on in your mind here? And these meetings have been amazing and has given me a lot and uh, I think it has given my environment a lot because it is a lot about not thinking that you have to reinvent the wheel because often we just think that we need to do that. And uh, so what did I know about kids? Well, I just went back to Valor and I was like, we are great in Valor when it comes to kids. So we have a summer camp in city and so I thought like, okay, we are gonna do summer camp in city because that's what I know. I've been the principal there and I've been uh, the team leader and all that. So I know this, so we can do this. But we decided to do it in a different way than in Iceland that we would give this free to the kids. Because there are a lot of kids in Sweden that need the free thing. They don't afford doing stuff that costs. So we just went on doing uh, Kostnads free summer camp in city with uh, Kristianstad. And it ended up uh, in a spin-off effect doing uh, fall camp in city and Christmas camp in city. So we went on doing, uh, we had the kids between 8.30 and 1 on Christmas Eve. And why? Because there are so many kids in Sweden that come from uh, cultures where Christmas is zero and they want to experience Christmas. And we just did a lot of stuff like this, ending up with full classes everywhere, no spots empty three months before we start. That's why we ended up doing more on different uh, seasons. And then uh, spontaneous sports, which we started because of the camps, doing every week and every second week sometimes. Then we just come out with a lot of stuff for the kids they can do whatever they want with us, playing handball, basket, whatever. And we are a platform for them to go into different sports. So I go, I go talking to a kid that likes uh, karate or something, and then we go like, okay, then I call a coach uh, there and we help you going there. And it has nothing to do with football, but I can promise you one thing. I made sure in the moment where I helped that kid to go to another sport, that you also come to our games. And doing this, the older people suddenly just came to the spot where we had the spontaneous sports. Because they come with the kids, 
the grandmother and the grandfather, and they're like, why don't you have anything for older people? Oh, maybe we should do that. So we started doing stuff for the older people. And uh, when COVID came, we couldn't do that, but we still did. And I have a video and I can't show you. <laughs> so uh, you can see full houses and balconies with all the people dancing with us and doing and moving and smiling and I don't know what. We couldn't train. So we did this instead. And this is about just what Svale was talking about. It's like being happy and finding something new and just repeatedly being happy. And you, like all of them are so happy doing this that it's just ridiculous. We were gonna be three at a time. We ended up being at least nine every single time because you didn't wanna miss out on uh, the balcony uh, dancing. And this film is actually great. So just uh, Google this. It was everywhere in media in Sweden. Uh, Balkon Jumpa. Uh, and yeah, that, that's the video. And, uh, <laughs> and then now this is just a part of our club. All of this, you go into uh, Kurieffet in the society and then you find everything we uh, can offer. We offer kids in motion with spontaneous sports. We offer still in motion, which is spontaneous sports for older people. We have after school, which is coming to the school directly when school ends and having football for girls. Uh, we have summer camp in city. We have Christmas camp. We, now we have football camp in the fall and the spring. And this is enough, actually. <laughs> and. Uh, this has given us new spectators. This woman came to the older people spontaneous sports, bragging her man who hates football, loves ice hockey, to loving football, both of them buying season cards, both of them coming to our weight games when we offer a bus, always. Buying lotteries, buying shrimps, buying whatever we sell, being a big, club, big part of our club. So we had the first activity uh, this year, yesterday, and I wasn't there, so she texted me. That's why I put the picture with her. I missed you today. I hope you come next week. Yeah, the, a message like this gives you a lot. It gives you a lot of kids waiting for the role models. And believe me, this is not common in Sweden, that a girls are, or kids are running around after our players. But it's like that every single day now. We give and we get. Of course, we do the Valor stuff and we just run into their games and go uh, cheering for the American football team in town because they are small, just like us. And then suddenly they come to us, guys in the AIDS that would not go cheer for girls normally, but they do. I have no idea, I'm working over this time and uh, I have uh, 30 seconds left. Okay, I wanna end with uh, this. I think this all, what, I, what I'm speaking about is all coming from passion and engagement, and it attracts people, and it attracts people that get loyal. So it's extremely easy for us today to find people working on our games, uh, taking care of our kids, working in our camps, helping out with walking football with older people. I don't care what, they just love being with us. And it gives us all happiness, and, and we grow, and we become more successful and we find friends for life. So I just want to end up telling you about this guy because he is a millionaire and he just called me one day and he said, I love Iceland and I have money. I was like, okay, <laughs> this is a good match. What are, we, what, are you do, what, are, what are we doing here? Like I didn't even want to dream. And uh, he's actually the one that paid 800,000 of the money that we needed that day, 2016. He saved us, this guy. And one year ago, he got a stroke. And uh, he's in a wheelchair now. And I go visit him once a month, at least. And he says to me now, I have no friends. Nobody comes visiting me. But when I was walking on two feet, I had phone calls at least 10 times a week because everybody wanted to speak to me because they wanted my wallet. Nobody cares about me. Our club takes care of this guy with a physio, uh, with visits, 
cinnamon rolls, I don't care what. He comes to us every single time we invite him, but we make sure that we pick him up as well. I'm pretty sure we are the only thing he has. This is also a project, and this is Friends for Life. An ambassador is something that is huge. I realized that last year, and this is the last picture I'm gonna show you, because uh, I don't care about individual prizes if I'm the coach of the year or whatever. It's fun, definitely. It's great to get awards for doing something great. It's great for my team, my players, my coaches, the club. But I was invited to a gala last year, and I had no idea what was going on. And I get an uh, award from the politicians from the town uh, where they uh, make me a gold ambassador for uh, Kikansa, for the town. And I was so shocked. And I have to tell you that I've never been so proud of a prize because I knew at that moment that the plan uh, that I made and I got people to, to believe in and buy into it worked, even if it started with the moss. Thank you.